Hello and welcome to We Are Not a Stereotype, Breaking Down Asian Pacific American Bias. Thank you for being here with us for this inaugural series of talks created for educators by educators. My name is Andrea Kim Neighbors and I'm the Manager of Education Initiatives at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in Washington, DC. We could not have made this talk and series possible without our brilliant speaker and educator, Senmori Soundaradajan, who you'll be hearing from shortly. We're grateful for this space that they're creating with us to talk about caste in the United States. As Then Mori and I are in different parts of the United States, we wanna begin this talk acknowledging the people and lands our speakers are currently on. We would like to acknowledge the people of the land, past, present, and future. The Piscataway, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian Institution is located. The Lenape, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Brooklyn, New York, where Then Mori is located. We also want to take a moment to recognize those nations who are not, who are not acknowledged, yet occupy or have occupied the lands we teach on. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, since the series would not be possible without their support. This project received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, as well as support from Expedia. We would like to thank them for sponsoring this series and for making this learning opportunity available online for educators across the country. I'm now pleased to introduce Thenmori Soundaradajan, a Dalit rights activist, artist, and technologist. Currently, Thenmori is the co-founder and executive director of Equality Labs, a Dalit civil rights organization that uses community research, cultural and political organizing, popular education, and digital security to build power to end caste apartheid, white supremacy, gender-based violence, and religious intolerance. Thank you for joining this talk, Breaking Down Caste in the United States. Jay Beam, and hello everybody. Uh, my name is Thenmori Soundarajan, and I'm, again, I'm here with Equality Labs. And I'm so excited to be able to do a deep dive into the history of caste in the United States. And part of why this history is so important is that when we look at the history of the United States as a whole, there is no one American story. And each of our critical threads that kind of go into the braid of our nation um, has both positive and powerful things that we bring in terms of resilience, but also very difficult things that actually can teach us better about who we are in the face of adversity, but also how we might carry um, oppression. And, and as we look at this very critical juncture of where we are as a country today, what's really important is to look at our roots in all of their glory, you know, and in all of their wards and be able to understand and even though this is where we have come from, we actually have much that we can do to change and determine a future where all of us have equity. And so that is really the, the kind of DNA of, you know, why we are talking talking about this because my goal with you guys is to be able to see how history can really inform a powerful pathway um, into the future. So let's start a little bit with who are South Asian Americans? And, you know, I often get this question, you know, where it's like, do you mean Southeast Asia? Or does that mean like you're Vietnamese? Or do you, you know, where are you in the world? And I think it's really important to understand that, you know, when we are talking about South Asian Americans, we are talking about Americans who, um, whose heritage really comes from any of the countries in South Asia. And this includes Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, as well as Myanmar. But it also very critically includes people who were indentured from, you know, this part of the world and, you know, secondarily came to the United States after that first primary point of migration. So we also include folks that are Indo-Caribbean and Indo-Fijian. And what's so remarkable about when we think about the South Asian immigrants that make up the American fabric today, we are part of a huge portion of the world. In fact, there are 1.75 billion South Asians in the United States. I'm mean, sorry, there are 1.75 billion South Asians in, in the world. And that means one in six people in the world are South Asian. And in the United States, there are 5.4 million. 
And we are part of a growing group of Asian Pacific Islanders that are set to become one of the largest minority groups in the United States overall. So what's important about our history is that our history isn't just Asian American history, it is American history. And so the lessons we learn there are lessons that we can take for all Americans. Now, the other question that like, I really wanna make sure that we have a good understanding about as we start to examine the history of caste in the United States is in fact, what is caste? And when we talk about caste, caste is a social category very similar to race. And caste apartheid is a structure of oppression that affects more than 260 million and this exclusionary system ranks people at birth with one's caste determining every aspect of their life, from their job, where they can live, whom they marry, even who they worship. And what's so critical about this is that caste has its origin in Hindu scripture. In fact, Brahmins who created this system um, were at the top of the caste system and they've benefited from centuries of privilege, access and power because of it. But while those who are at the bottom of the hierarchy are the untouchables, or as we call ourselves, Dalits, we were branded untouchable because we were seen to be spiritually defiling within the caste system. And that really sentenced us to a violent system of apartheid that pushed us into separate neighborhoods, places of worship, and schools. And this caste discrimination that exists in the United States is not as widespread and, and, as, and overt as it is in India and South Asia, it definitely exists here as well. And for people that kind of want to know, like, how does the caste work and like, where does it all get situated? This is the caste pyramid. And most of you have seen some version of this, like in a history class, like when you're growing up. And the idea of caste is that each caste is breaking up um, a part um, and refers to a different part of the god Brahma's body. And, you know, the, the part of the body, you know, especially the ones that are top of the body are the most pure. So the castes that have that relationship are actually seen as more pure and have more desirable jobs, while those at the bottom start to get more and more impure and face more and more discriminations. So in the larger caste system or the Varna system, you see priests are at the top, you see the Kshatriya caste as warriors who are the second part and they come from Brahma's chest, whereas Bra the Brahmins come from the head. Um, the Vaishyas come from the abdomen and those are the merchants. And you see Shudras who um, come from the feet and they're like the peasants and the servants. And the folks and the castes that are outside of this system are those that were untouchable. Again, the people who were seen as spiritually defiling. That's why they were outcasted out of this system. And they were forced in to slave and bonded and agricultural labor that was very terrible and extreme in terms of your exposure to violence. And there's also indigenous groups of people that are not part of the caste system at all. And they refer to themselves as tribal peoples or Advasis um, or their, their tribal name. And what's important when we talk about the caste system is not just to know which caste someone might be from, but also that this is not just a situation of like interpersonal relationships where, oh, you know, I have someone, I might be someone who's from a dominant caste or an upper caste, but in fact, you know, I'm not casteist uh, because I have Dalit friends. This is also a situation where we want to think like any of system of oppression, also about the structural aspects of how the system might work. So when you look at this pyramid, the people at the top actually have a larger access to ownership of land and, you know, positions in like institutions and society, as well as access to resources, you know, like clean air, water, and, um, and a life free of violence. And the lower you get on your, the pyramid, the more you start to lose that access and the closer your proximity to structural exclusion and violence. And as someone who is Dalit, I have seen the structural manifestations of caste so deeply, both in the United States and in India, that it's important to talk about this problem. Because when we talk about problems, we actually find the pathways to solutions. 
Now, what's really interesting, especially as we start to, you know, go into trying to understand well, where did caste exist in, the, you know, in North America? And when was the first South Asian here? And did South Asians always like, you know, have caste everywhere that they go? Or, you know, did caste just come like in the last five years? And I think one thing that I really want to emphasize for everyone that is like watching this lecture is that unfortunately, everywhere that South Asians go, they bring caste. And so from the first written anecdote that records a South Asian coming into North America, their caste is mentioned. And this graphic, which is from the East India Marine Society, has some of the first records mentioning the first um, South Asians that came to our country. And uh, what's so interesting is that, you know, the East India Marine Society actually had the records of mariners and people who were traveling all throughout the, the global south. And it was through their records that people would get insight to um, cultures and societies like all around the world. And it was during this period um, in uh, the late 1700s, where there was the diary of Reverend William Bentley, who was, um, you know, a reverend who ministered in Salem, Massachusetts, which is where um, the society was based. And he wrote about the first Indian that came to Salem. And this is one of the first records we have of uh, a South Asian um, in, in North America. And what he wrote is that he had the pleasure of seeing for the first time a native of the Indies who was from Madras. He was of dark complexion, had long black hair and soft countenance. He was tall and well proportioned. And very critically, what he also wrote was, he is said to be darker than Indians in general of his own caste. I didn't have the opportunity to judge his abilities, but his countenance was not expressive. And he came to Salem with Captain Jay Chibout and has been in Europe. So what is so remarkable to me, especially as a Dalit who was reading this work, was that, you know, here was a white reverend who really had no context of India. He just remarked upon his chance meeting with this person. And the Indian himself, when he was sharing himself uh, in the introduction, had to mention caste as one of the signifiers. And he wasn't saying it because he was um, someone who was caste depressed and wanted to make clear, like, I'm from a caste depressed community. He said that I am darker than members of my own caste, but he was making the distinction saying he was not lower caste. And that's kind of how I read that statement. And it was significant enough to um, that he shared it that this reverend wrote about it. So almost, you know, what is so important, I think, for everyone that's South Asian American and for other Asian American, you know, uh, folks that are watching this is to know that, like, the, the, the fact that this is such a critical detail written in such a small excerpt shows caste is always on our mind when we're talking about South Asia. And the only reason why it has not really been discussed more fully to date is because we didn't have parity in terms of the scholarship of looking at this time of caste oppressed scholars to dominant caste scholars to be able to bring a caste lens to um, this experience. The other thing to kind of know about, you know, that early part of the South Asian American um, diasporic history is that there was also a critical, another critical reason why caste was such a significant um, player in terms of the composition of the first South Asians that came here. And that has to do with the idea of um, the Kalapani or the Black Water Prohibition related to travel in South Asia. And what that referred to is that, you know, within Hindu scripture, there was a prohibition of, you know, of dominant or upper caste people not being allowed to travel over the ocean because if they did so, they would actually lose their caste identification. So that became a real barrier for um, upper caste or dominant caste people to travel. And so it was mostly the poor and the disp dispossessed and the caste oppressed people that dared to venture um, uh, into ocean faring travel. And it was these groups of people that the English really exploited through the indentured system and trafficked as coolie laborers all throughout um, the world. And, uh, and that's why we have in some of our first South Asian American travelers, people who come from um, caste 
Cass Depressed or Bahujan Cass um, that, that really um, um, spanned the globe in their pursuit of trying to find a better life and, ex uh, you know, escape cast apartheid. So this picture here on the left is like one of those first ships where um, that were filled with coolie laborers. And the woman on the right is an indentured laborer from uh, Guyana. And, you know, I think that what's so important um, as we talk about the indentured system is that, you know, we do have many Indo-Fijian and Indo-Caribbean people who secondarily immigrated here. And what's important is that the culture and the, the travel and the struggle of indentureship was incredibly violent. The, the conditions on uh, many um, indentured ships were just as violent as that of the Middle Passage. And you know what was so profoundly arrogant of the English that put this system into place is that they decided to traffic in Indian indentured labor because slavery was made illegal. And so in freeing black communities, they decided that they still needed cheap exploitable labor. So they set up supposedly a better system of indentureship, which was actually just as vile, um, filled with all sorts of physical and sexual violence. But what was also very crucial is that indentured communities then also were put into um, a contentious relationship with the indigenous peoples of the lands that they were in, the, the, the existing black communities that were trafficked as slaves, and these communities that were also set up as an indentured labor. And above it all were actually Englishmen that were running all of the colonies. And so that's a really critical beginning also into this conversation about South Asian solidarity, but also South Asian anti-Blackness as it relates, um, as well as South Asian settler colonialism. So settler colonialism. And, and I think that we have to really look at that who we are as a people is definitely marked by the violence of white supremacy. You know, we are survivors of indentureship and um, political exclusion and violence. And we also have to be very conscious how in white supremacy, we are put it, pitted against other communities and that we are not isolated out of history. We come into these very forced, forced violent immigration flows um, uh, and butt up against other communities that are exploited and that we in turn may be weaponized against as well. And so in looking at these early, you know, mixing of, you know, cultures under duress, but also um, solidarities that emerge, it's a really important lesson to kind of be grounded in as South Asian Americans today about how do we want to show up in the face of injustice? And that when we face injustice, how do we also want to build power with that's not just rooted in like, you know, transactional solidarity, but material solidarity, where we see each other in the same fight, but recognize our positionalities and also acknowledge um, the previous historical wrongs, wrongs that we um, are flowing into. The other thing that I think is really important to, to look at is that, you know, because of the Kalopani prohibition, the a great majority of those first migrants were in fact Punjabi. And, you know, at that time, the, you know, the, the American consciousness didn't really look at, you know, was somebody a Sikh or was somebody a Hindu? They just called all migrants from, you know, our region of the world, because keep in mind, India hadn't been formed yet as a country as Hindus. So, um, you Know, but the reality was is that these first migrants were in fact um, Punjabi Sikhs. And there was a couple of things that I think that were so distinctive about their travel. So the first thing was is that because of a lot of the racist immigration law at that time, they were not allowed to bring um, wives. So it was primarily a very male community. Um, and I think the thing that was also really interesting is that these Punjabi Sikh laborers were, um, were part of um, the people that actually established so many of the Western um, states infrastructure that we take for granted today. So we had Punjabi workers who helped build the railroads. Um, if you're from the state of California and you know Central Valley, 
Ali, Punjabi laborers, along with, you know, Mexican and Filipino laborers and other immigrant groups were the people that actually helped to dig up the swamps of the Central Valley and make it the fertile farmland that it is today. Um, and also, and going back to this er uh, other earlier image, the other thing that I think that was so critical about Punjabi um, workers is that um, all throughout the Pacific Northwest, they were part of the big lumber industry. So they were the ones that processed the wood that went into the timber that actually became the buildings and the infrastructures of the cities all across Canada and the United States. In those communities, the thing that is so important to know is that, um, and I just want to see if I have that um, image in here. Um, in those communities, what is so important to know is that they too also practiced untouchability. So I think what's so important to keep in mind in these early Punjabi communities is that even in those communities, you saw the first practices of untouchability and caste. And, you know, this is an image from some of the first um, Punjabi migrants that settled in British Columbia. And again, remember, these were the folks that worked the timber industry. And, um, and the thing that I, you know, I thought was so painful, I got a chance to meet, um, you know, my colleague, Anita Lal, who works with an organization called Poetic Justice. And her family has been in North America for three generations. So her Dalit forebearers were, you know, actually part of the first families to work the timber in British Columbia. And what was so funny, she was talking about her ancestor and how, you know, there was only like probably, you know, um, you know, a handful of workers that were working in that mill. And out of those um, workers, there was basically two that were Dalit. And, um, and the workers all knew that they were Dalit. And in fact, you know, they wouldn't let them sleep in the same place. And where everybody else was eating at the table, they made them eat at the floor. And, you know, the reason this was found out was because, you know, the owner came and he saw this thing that was going on. And he said, why are these two people, sleeping, you know, eating on the floor? And they mentioned, oh, it's because he's a Chamar, uh, which is an untouchable caste or a Dalit caste. And the owner was like, no way, we're all going to just be eating at the same table and we're all going to eat and sleep in the same place. And that's when that caste prohibition or untouchability was stopped in the workplace. But can you imagine that this was something that occurred from the first point and the first industry that South Asians were working in, we saw caste in the workplace. And that just goes to show you like how pernicious the system is. And also that I think what's really important for us who are South Asian and for people who are working with the South Asian American community is that while caste has its origin in Hindu scripture, caste is actually found throughout all of the South Asian faiths. And we should never take for granted, like, you know, whether it's in the classroom or in places of worship or in um, American governmental institutions, we need to always think about ways that we can be cast inclusive and um, and that, you know, you'd be surprised that when somebody says, oh, this is how we do it, but you see an exclusionary practice. You just want to ask a gentle question about is this really a cultural practice or is this part of the system of exclusion known as caste? Because we do get to be able to talk about these things because this is part of our journey in creating a more equitable um, United States. And, you know, talking about caste as well as other systems of oppression is, is vital to being able to create that solution together. Now, I want to show that, you know, and again, this theme that we've had throughout this whole talk is that, you know, we have these like internal tensions and hegemonies that we're dealing with as communities of color. And we're still having to have that all behind the background of white supremacy. And this was very much true with those um, Punjabi and early South Asian migrants, which is that um, what you're seeing is that um, you know, during the time that we had our immigrant communities like building railroads and um, clearing out the swamps of the Central Valley, we saw movements of white workers who were very upset with immigrant labor um, because they viewed like brown immigrant labor as labor that was um, undermining their demands for equitable wages. 
and should those workers have equitable wages and also the unions that they were fighting for? Absolutely. Like we should always have workers at workers' rights at the center of all of our conversations around justice. That said, I think one thing that white supremacy does very well in American history is it pits vulnerable groups against each other. So at that time, um, you know, similar to this moment that we're having, they're ha we're having right now, um, we saw a lot of efforts in the media and by popular figures pitting those white workers against brown workers and using very racist and xenophobic language to go after our people. So this is one of those advertisements. And again, this is in Bellingham, Washington against the um, Sikh community. And they would use these terms like Hindu, Hindu invasion. So Hindu hordes and have we a dusky peril? And you know, this, this level of violent language was also accompanied by mob attacks, you know, the setting to fire of places where people who were Desi lived and, and also, um, um, you know, um, you know, violent um, legislative action against our communities. So it was a very trepidatious and scary time to be a Desi. And, and I think that that also is a really critical factor to look at is that, you know, when white supremacy pushes our communities into fearful positions, you know, sometimes, you know, we might want to make an easy choice that's about us protecting ourselves, as opposed to thinking and collaborating solidarity. And, and I think that, you know, we know this moment now and many of us are having to make those choices, especially as we see the ask from the movement for black lives about how we want to show up to defend black lives. And I think that, you know, um, you know, each person has to really take that moral choice um, and really think about the flow of history as we make those choices. Because oftentimes the most easy, convenient um, action is not the one that actually brings us large transformative um, liberation. And so, you know, as I spoke about the kind of, you know, difficult laws that came out of this period and out of that xenophobia, um, period, um, you know, one of the most, you know, painful things I think that happened was that there started to be increasingly more and more racist immigration law. And you have to keep in mind at this period, and now we're, we've moved to like the early 1900s, you know, um, only white people could be um, seen as citizens. And on top of that, um, there was very, very fierce um, uh, regulation of, the, of immigrants that came from the Asian parts of the world. So in the Asiatic Bard Zone, you know, which is like kind of marked by this green area, um, there was, you know, some of the first like registration of immigrants that came from this area. You also saw like physical tests, like where people were, you know, very uh, aggressively examined in terms of their teeth and their organs offices and tests for like, you know, diseases because they viewed our communities as being disease ridden. Um, and also quite crucially, there was the racial framing uh, that only white uh, immigrants could be seen as citizen. So I want to really now talk about then how we started to see um, two Indians really begin to challenge the racist immigration laws of these early 1900s. So the person on the left is A.K. Mozumdar, and the post person on the right is Bhagat Singh, Bhagat Singh Thind. And these two folks um, made the argument that they were essentially um, brown white people because they were upper caste. And this was their way of trying to fight these racist immigration laws while also leaning into their dominant caste identity. And what was so interesting, that was like in A.K. Mozumdar's case, he talked about the fact that um, he was of Aryan descent and um, he was of Aryan blood because of being upper caste and therefore um, a brown Aryan and that white people and Caucasians were white Aryans. And so they were linked through shared ancestry and blood. While Bhagat Sin Thind actually made the argument in addition to what you know, A.K. Mozumdar said, he also said that as someone who would never marry an indigenous person from India because of his belief of not mixing castes, that he would be supportive of anti-miscegenation laws and, um, and make sure that there was um, you know, an enforcement of segregation of race um, 
and no race mixing in the United States. And when I hear that legacy as someone who's a caste oppressed American, you know, I am, I'm just disgusted uh, because I think what's so important here, and I go back to like the, the comments that I made earlier, is that we have choices as South Asian Americans and we have choices as Asian Americans that, you know, are we living under a violent white supremacist system? Absolutely. Um, that said, how we choose to dismantle white supremacy and the ways that we do it really reflect um, the kind of country that we will be on the outside of it. Now, I am not someone who wants to dismantle white supremacy and put up a system of hierarchy that features, um, you know, that still um, centers anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. And yet, in fact, these were some of the legal arguments that came out of, um, you know, these two cases. And so so, you know, ultimately, both of these folks like lost their challenge um, related to the racist laws at those time. I think what's really important is that, you know, the history of the immigration battles our community has had when it comes to caste um, really reflect the fact that we, when we don't reflect on our own internal systems of oppression, we often can then in turn create harm for Black Americans and Indigenous peoples of this land. And that really there is a place for us with other Americans to create new possibilities for racial um, equity and Indigenous sovereignty when we are honest about where we are, what we've come from, what our historical roots are, um, and that we can, we can fight for our rights with relationship to the immigration process without throwing any other community under the bus. And the anti blackness of both of these figures is a reminder that you know the legacies of South Asian American identity that pursues white adjacency is not really um, a, a pathway for dignity for our communities and is really just a turn off into more um, discrimination for everybody. Um, so I think that you know the, the other really kind of vital thing that was happening in South Asian American um, history at this time was the independence movement. And again, like on the West Coast, you have this powerful movement called the Gadar movement that sprung out of um, many of the good waters that were formed from the, you know, the fledgling Punjabi communities that were um, peppered there. And, you know, particularly out of the Stockton Gudwara, you had leaders all across the West Coast who were involved in, you know, very vital conversations about what a potential uh, you know, country could be free from the British. And they were engaged in conversations with activists all around North America and the UK. And um, what was so beautiful about the Gather movement was that it was one of the first movements of South Asian American liberation. Uh, I think what was also really critical is that in this movement, you had a very powerful leader, Mung Mungura Mugualia, who was actually one of the founders and one of the leaders of the Gadar movement, who was also Dalit and also in California. And what's so surprising about the Gadar movement is that if you ask most South Asian American historians and activists, they will be like, oh yes, Gadar movement, we know all about that. If you ask them, did they know that there were Dalits and caste oppressed people in it, there will be crickets. And that's because very few people looked at this history with a caste lens. But Manguram um, Magualia is such a critical figure, not just in the United States, but also in India, because after his time of the Gadar movement, and again, the Gadar movement not only catalyzed you know, resources and um, power built for Indian independence, they were also really famous for bringing a shipment of arms to the Indian independence movement so they could fight with the British. And so, you know, Mangura Ram was actually part of that journey. And when he got to India and he saw the independence movement, there was a part of him that just became so heartbroken because he's, he wanted to fight for freedom from the British. But as a Dalit, especially someone who had lived outside of India, he also wanted to be free from caste apartheid. And what he saw was that the independence movement would free the nation, but not free Dalits. And so for him, he said there was no possibility of, of freedom in this context. So he actually left political life. And then he started a spiritual movement in the state of Punjab called the Adar movement. And to this day, many Punjabis 
called themselves Adharmi as adherents and to also, you know, honor um, his tradition that he created. And throughout California and in um, New York, if you go to Dalit Ravadasya Gudwaras, you will see pictures of, you know, Manguram there in honor of him being one of the oldest Dalit activists who have been um, on these shores. So he's a really incredible figure to look at and also a really interesting, you know, inflection point when teaching South Asian and Dalit history, because again, because caste is both a, a, a system of oppression that weaves race, um, caste and faith into to one noose. Um, people find religious options, people find political options, um, and people find ways to kind of name it structurally. And so he's someone that kind of looks at all of those angles and is a great figure to kind of lift up and discuss in terms of his contributions to American and um, Indian history. Now, another towering figure that I think is also really important to look at is Dr. Ambedkar. And Dr. Ambedkar, you know, is this just historical towering figure that's like a once in a generation kind of um, kind of guy. And I think what's so powerful about him was that, you know, one, he was the architect of India's constitution. He was also one of the first Indians to um, travel abroad and he got, you know, um, degrees reason um, uh, both from the London School of Economics and also Columbia and he was prodigious in terms of his writings as like really the father of the Indian nation and the father of the Dalit movement. So the fact that such a significant figure to South Asian history, um, particularly since he was the writer of the Indian Constitution, um, was also someone who basically did some of his formative learning here in New York City um, in Columbia. Columbia University. And he was there during the Harlem Renna Renaissance and he studied under John Dewey. And his focus really was thinking about how do you build systems of governance and ruling and economics that could allow freedom for all people? And you know, while there's very few um, you know, writings of his time in the United States and his interactions with other oppressed people, I mean, the fact that he was here during the Harlem Renaissance and what he saw in terms of violence and discrimination shaped him so deeply. In fact, when he went to go write the Indian Constitution, he very much, you know, pointed to the fact that he saw that even in a country in a democracy like the United States, that Black people still were not given the right to vote. Neither were women. And those were things that he considered when thinking about the caste oppressed and gender equity when he wrote the Indian Constitution. So th this is a really, really critical South Asian American historical moment to really look at, not just for the caste lens, but also for the possibility of transnational um, uh, and for, uh, transnational liberation. And, you know, oftentimes, like when we teach immigrant history, it's it's thought of as like a terminus. It's that once people come here, their lives end in terms of their homeland and they're just American. But I think Dr. Ambedkar and even like Mangualam uh, Mugwalia is a good example, is that actually all of us who are hyphenated Americans who come from these scattered homelands, our process of immigration is not linear. Our process of immigration is actually circular and iterative. And that in many ways, we not only inform the American fabric, but we also inform the fabric of our homelands. And Dr. Ambedkar is a great example of that. Because there's, I think if he had not seen another fledgling democracy that had also freed themselves from the English, but had really crippled, them, crippled themselves in terms of race, that he too would not have have um, thought, I don't want that for my homeland. If we are going to be free, let us all be free. And that's why he wrote so you know, passionately within the Indian constitution, freedom for Dalits, uh, you know, the ending of untouchability and also rights for women um, in that regard. Now, one thing that I think that is also really like, you know, a very scintillating peak at this time also was that Dr. Ambedkar worked with um, and had a very small correspondence with W.E.B. Du Bois. And again, there's not a lot of his writings in the United States that intimate like what was Dr. Ambedkar's life and experience while he was in Harlem, but just this small exchange was really poignant. And I have that written here. And in this, 
he exchanged between Dr. Du Bois and Dr. Ambedkar, um, he asked Du Bois about the advocacy that um, you know, African Americans were doing to the UN. And at that time, it was not called the, the UN. I think it was called the, the, the League of Nations. He was asking about you know, if there was a way for um, uh, you know, if there was a way that Dalits might be able to have some sort of um, similar engagement and what was the process of their advocacy and their, um, their, their success at that. And, you know, W.B. Du Bois writes a very cordial and short letter back saying, you know, um, that this could be, um, you know, a potential area of organizing and that he would share the letter of the work that they had done and, um, and that he had great sympathy for the work um, that Dr. Ambedkar was doing on behalf of the Dalits. And to me, what this letter really reveals, and I think that is also an indicator of another really critical um, engagement around South Asian American history and caste, is that, you know, Black internationalism um, is really an inspiration for many movements of um, oppressed peoples around the world. And Black internationalism, most critically, was necessary because the structures of white supremacy and, you know, the incredible pressures that um, African American communities had in order to fight for their rights required them to go outside of the United States to build with other oppressed peoples to find ways to circumvent the, the insidiousness of the, the laws that denied them their humanity. And I think that the, the, the Black internationalism um, inspiration was really at the core of so many um, Dalits who, you know, really tried to also learn from that internationalism because, because again, I think with the caste system, we see that caste apartheid and the caste system set up by racial Jim Crow and white supremacy against um, Black Americans you know, we saw, you know, oppressed peoples would see each other in very profound and similar ways. And so Dalit internationalism was really um, born out of that, that learning and that yearning. And, and I think that's why there are so many interconnections over history between Black and Dalit libera liberation movements, because these are material solidarities that are really built out of a shared um, yearning for freedom and a shared understanding of what it means to build power at this time. Um, and in that spirit, I think another really powerful, you know, example of um, South Asian history that is born from this similar internationalism was the Dalit Panthers. And the Dalit Panthers, again, um, were inspired by the Black Panthers who came out of the 1970s. And what was so profound about this exchange was that, um, you know, the Dalit Panthers actually did not formally meet in, uh, with the Black Panthers in, you know, in a conference or in a meeting. It was just the inspiration of the fights of Black movements to fight for dignity, to fight for independence against, you know, brutal exclusion. Um, and also the way that the Black Panthers organized against violence against their communities, particularly around police violence, that inspired Dalit communities in Maharashtra to think about a similar organizing model. Because what Dalits were facing in India and throughout South Asia was incredible brutalizing caste violence where you saw people being lynched regularly and Dalit women being raped and structural exclusion that you just can't imagine. And what the Dalit Panthers did is they would read the manifestos and they would read the Black Panther um, uh, newsletters and from that created their own Dalit Panther manifesto saying that, you know, um, that they saw themselves as part of a movement of oppressed people in the world who are fighting for their freedom. And they, they adopted very similar tactics to um, the Black Panthers, where if there was a caste atrocity, um, you know, this movement, which was made up of organizers and poets and community leaders, they would march around the body of the person who had been um, murdered until evidence could be collected and an autopsy could be done. And it was only because that they did that, that there could be some sort of process of justice. Otherwise, everything would be hushed up and hushed up and then the body would be disappeared. And the courage and the inspiration of the Black Panthers 
you know, is really, you know, took seed in the hearts of Dalits that made this other powerful movement. And today you have a Dalit Panther Party inspired political party in Tamil Nadu, all from that legacy. So again, another really rich kind of like seed, you know, of South Asian American history, you know, and that also, you know, gives testament to this wonderful transnational engagement around caste and racial liberation. Now, I think another really kind of critical juncture that we want to look at in terms of the, the movement of caste formation is that as we start to get into the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, we see a new wave of immigration that is really opened up because of the winds of the civil rights movements. And again, this is, this is another nod to um, how much so many of our Asian American communities um, owe debts to the civil rights movement. Because of the 1965 civil rights laws, um, what we saw is that um, immigration was diversified and because of, you know, so many other uh, economic conditions related to, you know, the need for more workers in skilled professions, there was a huge brain drain from our part of the world where we saw doctors and nurses and engineers come in the 70s and 80s to set up the South Asian institutions that we now know. So this huge wage of, um, of immigration was then doubled again um, in the early 90s with the rise of the H-1B visa. So we saw that early layer of professionals then added on to with like IT professionals to create the big South Asian American community that we're in. And it was in these last 30 years that we really saw a huge sedimentation of caste. And we started to see lots of different kinds of caste discrimination um, cases and stories come out of our community. And one of the first cases, and this was a case actually that I got really politicized around caste, um, happened in the early 2000s. And what happened was, is that there was a landlord named Lucky Bali Reddy, um, who was the second largest landlord in the city of Berkeley in California. Second only to the University of California, Berkeley, which is pretty wild to so get an idea of like how rich this person was. And what was so critical is that, you know, Reddy was from a dominant caste, you know, while not Brahmin, he was a dominant caste. And as a landlord, he had a ton of buildings that he needed labor um, to help him handle, right? So what this man did is instead of hiring people um, with just wages and proper insurance, he basically went back into um, his village back home and trafficked all of the Dalits from his village to become undocumented workers um, in his restaurants and his buildings. And also quite despicably, he also trafficked young girls to be his sex slaves um, uh, at night. So at day they would work in his restaurant and at night they would be, you know, um, exploited by him. And the thing that was so wild about this case, which is why I think it's so critical, is that it happened in front of everybody's eyes. You know, if you went to that restaurant, they were working there. You know, if you lived in that building, you would see those young girls. Um, he was not ever hiding it. it, was never in darkness. He just had so much money. And he also was so used to it because this is the caste practice. Like the ready caste is actually infamous for trafficking in slaves, um, uh, in caste slaves back at home in India. And so it was just natural for him to be like, oh, I need labor. Let me just traffic in Dalits over here. And so this case just incensed people because the way that it found it was found out was just horrific. So he had a restaurant in Berkeley and right next to it was a building that had um, that was a slum building that he owned and there was a carbon monoxide fire. And in that fire, one of the young women that he was sexually exploiting um, passed away from the smoke and, you know, they panicked when they saw that she was dead and so he had other workers wrap her body in a rug and then try to smuggle it out onto the street and everybody was out you know in the street because like there was a fire right and in the middle of everybody they accidentally dropped the rug and her body rolled out into the street so when that happened i mean obviously people were taken aghast and they couldn't you know shove the body back in because you know she was there and so the police were called and, you know, there was an investigation and sure enough, like the young girl was like 13 or 14 and she was pregnant with Lucky Bali Reddy's body. 
So there's no way that he could deny um, that he was sexually exploiting her. And this launched like one of the largest campaigns um, to, you know, um, to get him prosecuted. And the thing that was so remarkable about this period was that it really catalyzed some of the first South Asian organizing in the Bay Area. And it gave birth to organizations like the Alliance for South Asians Taking uh, Action, ASATA, which is one of the oldest South Asian organizations in the country and in California today. Um, but it also was one of the first cases to discuss caste from a labor perspective and also from a trafficking perspective. And, you know, Lucky Bali Reddy was eventually convicted and put into jail. But because of this case, you had activists from all around uh, the California actually fight for and to pass some of the first trafficking laws um, in the state. And that's pretty significant when you think about California being the seventh largest economy in the world. And this really kind of goes to why it's so critical to teach caste is that when you have such a large, um, significant immigrant population as a South Asian American diaspora, the, the issues and discriminatory practices that happen in our community um, have impacts for all Americans. And so what we really want to make sure that we can do is really um, be able to create legal protections that, you know, include caste as a protected category because then we can avoid horrific situations like the Reddy case. But this case, again, was such a huge catalyzing moment. And for me, as a Dalit organizer, especially as a young Dalit woman, I was only a couple years younger than the girls that were um, that were being sexually exploited and were trafficked. And it was just an accident of fate that I was born in the United States and they were born into a state in India where they could be trafficked. And so I just remember being, you know, someone who was protesting there and, you know, talking with some of the other workers at that time. And it really made it clear to me that, you know, does caste, you know, manifest in the United States the way that it does in India or in South Asia? Absolutely not. But is it violent and does it have its victims and do we need a legal remedy? Absolutely. I never want to ever see someone be able to be exploited and murdered in the way that this young woman was. And, um, and I think that's why it's really important that we talk about caste that case was in the early 2000s, here we are in 2020. And we finally have, you know, a substantive conversation about caste in the United States, because this was the year that we saw the state of California launch a historic lawsuit against Cisco, the corporation. And they launched it because, um, and, they're the, and, and in this lawsuit, they are um, suing Cisco for civil rights discrimination against um, its Dulled employees. And, um, and the Dulled employee at the core of this case um, basically accused Cisco of creating a hostile workplace with relationship to caste. And I think that what's so profound is that you would not see this case, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but because of the visibility and the organizing that we've seen caste oppressed peoples do, um, we finally are able to have an American conversation about caste. And what's significant is that this is not a civil, you know, a civil case. This is launched by the state of California. And this means the world in terms of being able to understand um, that caste exists in many institutions and that the bravery of the John Doe um, complaint that this case was that he was able to clearly articulate like what makes a caste hostile workplace. So for for him, he talked about the fact that people tried to, you know, find out his religion and through finding out his religion, try to socially locate him in terms of his caste. As soon as they found out that he was Dalit, he started to get, you know, denied promotions. And then um, he was starting to give, you know, kind of segmented off from the rest of the team. And then very slowly given less and less work um, until he felt like there was no pathways forward. And the tension and the fear and the anxiety um, and the structural exclusion was so apparent that for the lawyers at the core of this case, they didn't need to be experts in caste in order for them to know that this was a civil rights problem. And that's what's so wonderful um, about the, the, the power of speaking up and being able to speak in one voice as a community about injustice is that, you know, the, the core of the Cisco case um, really rested on research that we did in. Um, 
um, inequality labs. And, you know, uh, we, we did one of the first surveys about caste discrimination, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But the increasing visibility of Dalit communities all across the United States has meant um, we will start to see more cases like this because we are not afraid um, of claiming power and asking for our rights and fighting for equal protections under American law. And, you know, there's so many positive things that I think that are coming out from our greater visibility. One of the things that I think is really great is that, you know, also in 2020, um, you know, our organization worked with Representative Ro Khanna to introduce a resolution celebrating the birth anniversary of Dr. Ambedkar, um, you know, who we talked about earlier. And this is such a win for South Asian American history because for so long, we've actually denied um, Dr. Ambed um, Dr. Ambedkar um, as a figure who was so critical in our diasporic history. So to have like one of the first Indian American congressmen in the state of California be able to recognize him and to work with the Dalit civil rights organization like Equality Labs to make this happen, it's again that way that history becomes full circle. And that sometimes in the past, like our communities may not have had all of the access of dignity that we should have had in that historical moment. But in present time, by telling their stories, we lift up their legacies into power and possibility. And it was such an honor as a Dalit woman who was inspired by Dr. Ambedkar's courage to be able to stand with, you know, Rokhana and to work with this resolution and to have Dalit women at the core of the writing of this. This was like such a win on so many different levels. I also just wanted to, to flag that, you know, I think the other critical moment of, you know, a cast in the diaspora and the history of, you know, both caste depression, but also the building of caste depressed people's power was that, you know, Equality Labs did this very powerful um, survey about caste in the United States and this survey was very difficult to, to conduct at the time that we did. We did this in um, 2015. And we did it as a, as a response to um, the fact that like when we were in conversations with caste depressed people, we saw that um, so many people were talking about caste discrimination here in the US. But then when you talk to dominant caste people, they would like be like, I, I don't really see it. I don't think it's a problem. I don't even know Dalit people. So what is this? So you can't have such two uneven conversations without an understanding of what's happening. And a lot of this conversation came into head during a very pivotal battle in California when you had caste oppressed people fighting to save the teaching of caste and, um, and, and the word Dalit from California tech textbooks because dominant caste people were trying to erase us from the caste, the caste history. And, um, and that was a very difficult thing to watch because what you saw was um, that if we didn't fight for our place in history, we were gonna see upper caste people try to erase us and tell their own story about caste apartheid. So in knowing that this was really critical for us to be able to discuss and to be able to to understand what's happening for our community. What we did was we uh, we basically did a survey and it took about a year for us to do. Um, and we just asked people basic questions about their experiences of caste discrimination um, all across the US. And at the time that we did it, it was very um, controversial. We had many South Asian organizations who basically said, oh, well, you know, um, we don't even know if we can ask this, like does asking about caste that could divide our community. They, some organizations convened their board um, to, to, you know, to see if it was all right to release the caste survey. I mean, it was that taboo of a topic to talk about um, that even having, asking people to talk about it and to do a survey about it was seen as controversial and divisive. And yet we were able to do it. And we had over 1,500 respondents um, from across the United States. And the, the results of that survey were just so intense. What we saw was that one out of four Dalits who responded said that they experienced some form of physical assault um, uh, in, based on their caste. Uh, one in three Dalits reported being discriminated against during their education, and two out of three Dalits reported being treated unfairly in their workplace. Just those three stats are just overwhelming to me, because that tells you that the numbers of discrimination that we're facing are incredibly 
large for a community, um, you know, that should really, you know, not have be, you know, that for a community that like most people don't even know about, and yet we're having some of the largest rates of discrimination uh, in the United States. The other thing that I thought that was so interesting was that you saw, you know, a large amount of Dalit, 60%, you know, experiencing caste-based slurs and derogatory comments. 40% said that they felt unwelcome at their place of worship. 20% said that they felt discriminated at a place of business. And over 40% said that they felt that they um, were rejected in a romantic partnership on the basis of caste. And because I I think of like the enormity of discrimination that people face, one out of two Dalits said that they lived in fear of being outed, meaning that they were passing because they were afraid of being out as being caste oppressed. And that to me was such a really um, amazing story uh, because I think that like once we have that data set as an organization and the larger Dalit American community really unified in trying to tell the story of our experiences of caste violence, but also in the building of caste power. And so we saw an unprecedented amount of events all across the United States. Um, you know, we are ourselves at Equality Labs, we had town halls, we did, you know, testimonies in front of human rights commissions. We also um, worked very closely with different city officials and um, uh, local governmental institutions. And that led to us working on the first congressional briefing of the discussion of caste in the United States. And this is, you know, a wonderful picture of all the people that were present that gave testimony and participated in the conversation. And these are all Dalits who fought um, in their own different communities to speak to caste within their partnerships, their professional settings, Things. And to have a win like this was so powerful. And it really set the stage for so many of the other conversations that we're having about CAS now. And it's a marker and a reminder that when we talk about problems, we can actually find solutions collectively. And so this is a really proud moment in history that I really want to just kind of lift up and that we can um, share together. You know, one of the things I just really want to leave people with, especially as we close out um, this, this short segment on CAS, you know, United States is that, you know, it is so important for us to talk about the complexities in our history. And there's a lot for us to be proud of in terms of South Asian American history. We have, you know, resiliency as it comes from white supremacy and surviving indentureship and, um, and being able to create um, powerful and, you know, wonderful leaders like who are contributing to all of the aspects of American life. But also, we really think that it's important that when teaching South Asian American history, include that unit about caste. Bring in these like small, very significant historical moments because they're not just um, the history of, um, you know, a few outlier South Asians. We are in fact, the caste oppressed are in fact, the core of the South Asian American community. And so when you don't tell our stories, you're actually missing a core part of who South Asians are and who Americans are. And when we tell our stories fully and we point to these problems, we can work collectively on these solutions together. So we look forward to being able to um, be able, able to carry this story into the future and one in which all of us are free from this violence of caste apartheid and that we can live in a caste-free world together. So thank you, everybody, and looking forward to finding you all online and discussing this more in the future. Thank you, NGB.